Hello, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar titled Vulnerable Lighting for Drawing and Works on Paper with Scott Rosenfeld. My name is Edward Kopp. I'm the chief curator of the Minial Drawing Institute in uh, Houston, which is a program of the Minial Collection. This was originally meant to be a physical event, but when it became clear that this would not be possible, we decided to make it an online occurrence. And it seems like most of us have become uh, experts in the past few weeks in the Zoom platform. Be it as it may, uh, the marvels of modern technology allow us to uh, involve so many of you in these events, hundreds in fact, uh, coming mostly from the United States, but also from uh, countries and continents further afield. And we're all thrilled to, uh, to have you. You are a very diverse audience. Uh, among you are conservators, curators, registrars, preparators, lighting experts, museum directors, architects, and more. And this wide range of background reflects, in a way, um, the fact that institutional decisions about lighting, um, big or small, usually involved um, different stakeholders whose priorities may not always align. Whether it's a decision about the lighting of a particular work of art or an exhibition, or uh, more crucially, if it's the design of a new space. Like so many of you, we at the Minier Drawing Institute care deeply about lighting. For us, this was a major consideration uh, when Los Angeles architects Sharon Johnston and Mark Lee were commissioned uh, to design our building. Open in late 2018, uh, the Minier Drawing Institute building is a, a rare freestanding facility expressly conceived to serve the specific needs of modern contemporary drawings, like collecting, storage, conservation, study and display. And one of the key questions that the architects sought to answer as they created their building was to find ways to allow visitors to adjust their eyes gradually from the bright outdoor light of Texas um, down to the low lighting conditions of a drawing gallery. And they found ways to reduce the light levels step by step. First by adding exterior gardens by the entrances with trees surmounted by gables um, that provide coverage. And by the time visitors reach the entrance space called the living room, uh, the light levels are further reduced, which helps create a transition. This space can be used for programming and for the display of non-light sensitive uh, works, such as this wall drawing, uh, which you see on the right by Berlin-based artist Jorin de Voigt. The study room offers a flexible solution where filtered natural light can be used, dimmed or altogether blocked out and replaced by artificial lighting. And here's a view of our gallery. How to balance the accessibility, legibility and comfort of viewing of light sensitive works on paper on the one hand and the long-term preservation on the other is a perennial question that we are all facing. It therefore felt appropriate to invite Scott Rosenfeld, who is a leading expert in his field. He is the lighting designer at the Smithsonian American Art Museum and Renwick Gallery in Washington, DC. And for over 20 years, Scott has worked on lighting art collections so that they, get they can be better seen, experienced and preserved. The advent of energy efficient LED lighting has led him to research new possibilities for manipulating the spectrum of light and to enhance vision and slow down the degradation of light sensitive materials. He has collaborated uh, with the US Department of Energy to field test LED pro uh, products in museum context. Um, he has also collaborated with the National Institute of Standards uh, and Technology, NIST, and the Pacific Northwest uh, lab, National Laboratory to access the color rendering of attributes of light. And finally, with the Getty Conservation Institute, the GCI, to better quantify how light damages art collection. Scott is a fellow of the Illuminating Engineering Society, IES, and a chair of their um, museum committee, where he has led a team uh, of experts that um, eventually led to the publication of the 2017 IES recommended practice for museum lighting. What you probably don't know about Scott is that he studied theater at university and he admits that he has, this has informed his work and his understanding of how 
uh, lighting effects um, the display of works on, on paper. And before we turn over to Scott, I'd like to introduce two Mania Drawing Institute colleagues who will moderate the question and answer sessions following Scott's presentations. And they are Kelly Montana, who is assistant curator, and Jan Burand, who is paper conservator. And now let's turn over to Scott. So thank you, Kelly and Edward. When we were kicking around ideas for what to call this talk, this was the one that we, we settled on, and for pretty obvious reasons. The works in our care, the works on paper, are extremely vulnerable to light damage. And I think there's more in the air than that, of course. Um, this is where I work. Smithsonian American Art Museum, we share the building with the portrait gallery, and whoever thought that it would be so precious to see people gathering in our museums, that simple thing that we used to take for granted um, is so precious. This is a vulnerable time. And vulnerability speaks to the specific issues of this topic, how we deal with the unknown, the unpredictable, and the things that are potentially damaging how I long that that subset of things is limited to how we're preserving light sensitive materials and um, preventing damage. Um, that will, the, those days will come soon enough when we can once, around, once again gather safely together. Um, it was also worth noting that dealing with issues of vulnerability is difficult. And perhaps our greatest educator in dealing with those issues comes from Brene Brown, who whose research is conducted at the University of Houston just three or four miles from the Manil collection. Now, I searched through my pictures. I've had thousands of pictures of designs I've done over the years, and this is by far my favorite, and one of the rare ones of light-sensitive materials. Because, honestly, because we're using such low light levels, with light-sensitive materials, there are fewer choices to be made. And it's actually kind of the purest example of what the great lighting designer and thinker Kit Cuddle says is, the best way to light an artwork is to put it in a well-lit room. And that's what you're seeing here in, at American Arts Lincoln Gallery, where the Masama Oko, which is what you're seeing here. A couple things to note here. One is we're seeing a lot of images on screens art these days. And this is a reminder of all the things that we're missing by not seeing the real thing up close. Most obviously, the huge scale of Masama Oka's take on woodblock prints. A couple other things to note, this is a very light sensitive artwork that's painted on canvas. And while we often think about works on paper as being the most light sensitive, it is dependent on the color and the paint that the artist is using more than the substrate. Some papers are extremely Durable. And the last thing is, coincidentally, while this was one of the images that really came to mind to express this idea of vulnerability, of very light sensitive, I, it turned out to be a, a quite vulnerable image. And specifically speaking to a previous era of epidemic, pandemic, the mid 1980, and then 1986, Teroka had lost because of the AIDS epidemic, and he was inspired to start painting this series as a reaction against the government's, how the government was dealing with that pandemic of AIDS in the mid 1980s. And here's what we do, display and preserve. That's at the very core of what museums do. And of course there's tension between these two because if you can see a light sensitive object, it's being damaged and yet as museums, we must deal with that tension and do both, display and preserve. There's several other things that museums do, including interpretation, that some of the objects were never meant to be seen in a museum, and that we're taking them sometimes out of context, and no matter how we present them, there's an interpretation function, and that that interpretation function shouldn't be self-serving, but always to display, preserve, and interpret for the object and in service of the artist and materials we have on view. Here's one of my favorite examples. This is the Smithsonian American Arts Gilded Age Galleries, and I'm gonna show you, well, in just a minute or two, just about everything I know about light, 
by lighting this one gallery. First, I'm going to turn the lights off. You see a bit of light peeking in from the outside, from the uh, adjacent galleries. I'm going to turn one light on at a time, and hopefully your bandwidth is good enough that as I turn one light on, you can see that happen. And my slides are keeping up with your bandwidth. So each one of these lights is approximately the size exactly of from the cove to the floor. And this is called a wall wash. This is the first base level of lighting. It's about 50 lux, just about the level of light for very light sensitive materials. You could be done here if these were works on paper, but they're not, they're oil paintings, which can take four times the amount of light. So we spotlight each one of these paintings individually. Now I just turn them on one at a time, but that could be one light or four lights. I'm matching the size of the light to the size of the artworks. Next are the sculptures. And finally, the back wall. Now on the back wall, what you're seeing is Augustus St. Gaudens um, Adams Memorial, located in the Anacostia funeral. And that's what this photograph is. It's actually, this is exactly where the sculpture sits in that graveyard. Let's take a closer look. So, Gaudens sculpted this at the behest of Henry Adams to commemorate the death of his wife who had committed suicide. And it begs the question, what can we do with these exhibit people to help communicate these ideas? I saw that Gaudens had a veil that he didn't necessarily want the face of the sculpture to be fully illuminated. We still illuminated it so you could see the, beautif the beauty of that face, if I can get it. Ah, there she is. Just softly illuminating be beneath the veil. So when you're close to the sculpture, you can see what's going on. But as you back away from the sculpture, her face goes into shadow, as I believe Gaudens had envisioned. That's why he gave us such a deep veil. So we're looking deeply at these objects seeing what moves us and making doing everything in our power so our visitors can receive what these artists are offering display preserve and interpret we're going to take, continue to take a deep dive into each one of these especially display and that's going to actually happen in about 20 minutes because we're going to do a really deep dive into preservation issues let's start with Gary Thompson. And it's, it's really lovely that for all of the pain of the pandemic, that we have moments that we can dive deeper and take a moment and think more deeply about issues that we would not necessarily have the time to spend in our um, <laughs> previous and future workaday lives. Gary Thompson wrote the classic, The Museum Environment, in the 1970s. From our generation, he was one of the first great standards writers that started really ensconce um, the light levels that we use today. I've been told that Gary Thompson really did not want to put specific numbers down, but he knew that we needed them and that people were begging him to, to, to issue specific guidelines and numbers like 50 lux or 200 lux. And this is what he said. He's, we have to balance by judgment rather than by scientific formula two incommensurables, two things that can't be measured against each other because they're apples and oranges. The amount of light needed to look at exhibits against the damage from which it causes. We are now in the realm of controversy because these are two different things that are in tension with each other. It's a genuine paradox. And today we're going to spend time grappling with that paradox. And we're going to do it with the control of light. This is um, how I like to speak, talking, beginning all of my talks, which is this is everything I know about light. This is everything that I can control about light. I open my eyes in the morning and I see, and this, is, this list of five things explains everything about how I see light. There's the intensity of the light, pretty obviously. Is it bright and how bright? And we can control that. Distribution would be painting with light. I've heard the secret of light is to put the light where you want it and take it away where you don't want it. You may start with a spotlight or a floodlight. What is the size of that spotlight and floodlight? How do you distribute those spotlights and floodlights around your galleries with great intention? 
It could be sunlight and how sunlight either flatly illuminates a room or perhaps lights one corner brighter than the next. These are all, each one of these topics, there's not good and bad, it's what we do with them and how we have mastery over them. The angle of light is the only one out of the five which isn't about the lighting source itself, but where is the light coming from? Is it coming from above, from a window, from below? Where do we put the lights? The movement of light. This is perhaps one of the most powerful. Every time I go from slide to slide, that's an example of movement of light. The sun going across the sky, a candle flicker, moving lights, the spectrum of light. This list was the earliest examples I've seen of this list came from the practitioners and the early teachers of lighting like Stanley McCandless and the artist Thomas Wolfrid. They spoke of the color of light. Within new advents in LED lighting, we now have mastery of spectrum of light, of how the energy itself influences color and how we see colors of light. We're going to do a deep dive on each one of these topics today, starting with intensity, because it's perhaps the most important because controlling intensity will determine preservation. If you don't know, if you know only two numbers today about the intensity of light, it's these two numbers. 50 lux for the most light sensitive materials and 200 lux for things that are more durable like oil paintings. A couple things worth noting. Oil paintings, things that are lowly, that have, have a low light sensitivity to light can take four times the amount of light and last 50 times longer. Another thing to notice is the span. We measure damage in just noticeable fades, and we use special uh, measurements, spectrometers and such, to measure these. And you see the, the wide band here, that the first noticeable fade will happen at 50 lux, at eight hours a day, in as quick or quicker than a year and a half. These numbers are coming specifically from the Canadian Conservation Institute, and I'll share a little bit more information from them before. The CCI is extremely generous with sharing information so we can start trying to make these risk assessments, um, decisions. And how long will it take that first noticeable fade to happen? Between a year and a half and 20 years. And it's very difficult to know where it is because of the difficulty knowing exactly what the materials are and where they are in their fading curve, and we'll talk about that. One more thing to note before I leave this slide is these numbers were chosen to optimize how we see. And that lux is a photopic measurement. It's about how it's a psychophysical measurement of vision. We may use them for damage, but they're made for to express how we see. 200 lux is actually the more controversial because what is an optimal amount of light is much more difficult to pinpoint than the minimal amount of light. The minimal, minim, minimal amount of light is thought to be about 30 lux to see color on a 50% reflective material. That's the very minimum. Below 30 lux, a young person is thought not to be able to see color well. They're not photopically adapted. 50 lux is a little, slightly more comfortable view, and we're going to take a look at that in a minute. For much of my career, 75 lux was a very common metric. In preparation for today's talk, I was talking to George Sexton, who started his career at the National Gallery. Back then, Robert Feller, great conservation scientist, was advocating even higher quantities of light, according to George, up to 12 foot candles. These levels of light have changed over the years, yet it's always true, the greater the quantity of light, the greater the rate of damage. So we really use the minimum quantity of light we need to see. Why is it so important? I got these great examples from the Harvard print collection of Tori Kunyobo seeing the safflower. Both of these paintings are the same artist. And you see the pinks here? This is safflower, which is extremely light sensitive. What you see in yellow here is safflower that is faded. And that's why these are such difficult choices to make. 
Light damage is permanent and irreversible. 50 Lux will damage artworks. And whether it's enough to see is a different question. But if, if we do our jobs well, they will be. And we'll talk about that. How do we measure light? This is a light meter. I'm going to hold the light meter parallel to the artwork. In this case, this Peter Bloom drunk this Peter Bloom drawing. Now, let's be careful you don't tilt the meter up towards the artwork. If you do that, you actually see your hand and the meter. The numbers will get brighter. We're measuring the same angle of incidence that's hitting the artwork. And that little dot is the part that measures the luminance. Illuminance is a lumen per meter squared, which is lux, or a lumen per foot, which is a foot candle. There's a factor of about 10 between them. So five foot candles basically equals 50 lux. Now, it's important to note that that's the amount of psychophysical energy, this lumen per square area hitting a surface. The amount of lighting, light that hits comes back towards your eye is luminance. I'm going to talk about both of them. So luminance is how much light heads back towards your eye, and illuminance is how much light hits the surface. We largely use illuminance meters because they are relatively inexpensive. A really good one costs about four or five hundred dollars. And a luminance meter is much more expensive, several thousand dollars. Both of them are using what you see here, the luminosity function. Ooh, that's a little early. The lumin luminosity function is basically defining what the lumen is. This was um, first settled on as a standard in the early 1920s. They measured just 52 people to determine this curve, and it hasn't changed since. Those early scientists weren't actually able to measure the blue cone. They just measured the green and red cones. And yet we've decided to keep that original metric because it's used for its primary function, which is commerce, to determine whether this lighting fixture is brighter than this lighting fixture. And for that use, the, il the lumen, which is what illuminance is based on, is extremely useful for commerce. But if you're depending on these metrics to precisely tell you how bright things are, the precision just isn't quite there. They can do a reasonable job, but especially when you get down to the low light levels that we're using, they're not as accurate as we would like them to be. It's also important to know that museums often use these metrics for damage when that's not quite what they're measuring. What we're seeing here is a scale from 400 to 700 nanometers, and this is the sensitivity of human vision, largely in the green. And on the x-axis is the rainbow, from red to violet, Roy G. Biv, with green being the peak of human vision, and we've got relatively less vision in blue and red. Damage metrics include UV, which we want to get rid of. Spectral damage function, which is even um, a better metric than UV metrics for assessing short wavelength energy because the blue and violet and ultraviolet energies are much more damaging, so we, we try to minimize those. And damage action spectra, which is actually dealing with the whole issue, which is how much does a specific artwork and a specific color on a specific artwork, what is that rate of damage for that? Much more complicated, and we want to deal with the entire problem in all of its complexities as well as we can. This is just what we get, which is a little depressing. As we get older, our eyes yellow, they thicken, and we need more light to see equally well. They say by the time we're 50 years old, only half the amount of light will hit our retina as when we were 20. And this experiment done in, the in 1997 is expressing that idea. What we're doing is we're taking the Farnsworth Munsell 100 hue discrimination test. And I, I encourage you to take a look at this. This will test your color vision so you know how well you're seeing color. And to grade these colors in hue order for each one of these colors, more light will reduce the amount of errors. So light in illuminance is on the x-axis. On the y-axis are the error bars. So it takes about, what, 2,000 lux here, or 200 foot candles, to do as well as we can for an optimal amount of light. Now, I first um, saw this. I think Jim Druzik actually presented it to me. But I did a presentation last year called Do Metrics Matter with 
the scholar and great lighting designer, Malcolm Innes. And Malcolm showed the slide and he normalized it at 50 lux and for a 50 year old. And what he was seeing was a few things. One is that the difference between 50 lux and 200 lux, the error rates double by the time we get down to 50 lux for a 50 year old. He also saw that a 20 year old only needed eight lux to see equally well. This, these are average numbers. So the average 20 year old, the average 50 year old. And the average person between 60 and 69 years old needs three times the amount of light at 150 lux to see equally well as the average 50 year old. Deciding that we're only gonna put 50 lux, it's a fine metric and it will allow us to light objects well enough, but you can see here what may be lost. And yet this is where we are. We're still at 50 lux, 200 lux. But it's important to know that if you cannot see at these levels, you're damaging these objects without good purpose. It may not be justifiable. Um, I created um, many years ago a link, and some of you have already used it. It's tinyurl.com slash museum lighting. If you go here, you're going to be asked to short, fill out a short form. Even if you already filled it out, try it again. Then you'll be sent to a series of links. One is with the Dropbox, where I've got a catalog of information, which I'm constantly updating, on museum lighting. There's also, I included a link to um, my collection of videos online, which take today's topics and go a little bit deeper. conscious preservation of museum choices. That's what I'm urging us to do. And Stefan Mikowski urged us in the 1990s. And still, thankfully, Stefan Mikowski is still out there providing extraordinary information. Where in 1990, in this paper, he said, it is the museum's consensus, or the artists, or the tribal owners, especially the owners, who may prefer a short effective life to a long shadowy one. But the decision, decision should be conscious, not by default. In, I believe, the same paper, Stefan Mikowski said, conservators are expert counsel to tell us how long things may lay, live with a given exposure. They are not the lighting police, to, but expert counsel to help us make good risk assessment choices. Why stuff gets damaged by light? So I've tasked us, all of us together as a group, designers, curators, conservators, to come together and make good risk assessment choices. And as much as um, I'd like to move on to other topics, let's go even deeper into these issues of preservation so we can own the responsibility to make conscious choices. Here I'm going to lean heavily on CIU 157. If there's a Bible for how stuff gets damaged, okay, the paper was Control of Damage to Museum Objects by Optical Radiation. It's, it's a little, doesn't roll off the tongue quite as easily. These are the four things that is as much process as defining how things get damaged. We're going to go through this on a list. But, but first of all, let's define light because light is key to each one of these. Light is what we can see. You're seeing here another SPD or spectral power distribution. On the left hand side, you get ultraviolet. Ultraviolet super light damaging. We get rid of it. It's basically anything below 400 nanometers. As you go to UV and below x-rays, gamma rays, this is the highly energetic light which changes cells, which causes cancer. On the other side, as you go hotter and hotter towards the red, you're heating things up, you're cooking them. And we wanna get rid of both of these on our collections. There's no reason to have either of these energies because they don't help you see. What is in the middle is what you call light. That's what we see, that's what we need. Light is still damaging. Getting rid of the ultraviolet is not gonna take care of the problem. You still need to carefully control the quantities of light. And if you can feel heat on the objects, you're damaging it for sure. I'm going to take this list, 
put it up in the upper hand line corner. And when I was developing with our committee, and actually I wrote personally this chart, and the committee within the Illuminating, Illuminating Engineering Society accepted it to include in the recommended practice. So I took what the CIE offered, the International Lighting Organization, and I put it on a, flow, a decision flow chart. And I took each one of those, light intensity, intensity, duration of exposure, and instead of spectrum, I used daylight. So we could go into each one of these topics with greater clarity. Now daylight, of all the lighting sources we use today in museums, the common lighting sources, it is perhaps the most damaging because it is broadband, and if it's not well filtered, may include ultraviolet. I'm gonna replace this glyph up here with that whole graphic you just saw so we can take a closer look. The top of the decision tree is seen here with the red dots. And we ask our question, ourselves the question, is the material light sensitive? Everything isn't light sensitive. Marble, anything born of fire, as my friend Hugh Shockey would tell us, anything that saw like a, anything that was in a kiln, ceramics, anything that saw a lamp, like a glass, None of those things are light sensitive, even if they're very colorful. You can light them with as brightly as you want, and those things will not get damaged by light. If it is light sensitive, we're going to take another step down the tree. Next, we have to define how light sensitive is. This is done by a conservator. That is the only way to do it accurately. I'm a designer, way beyond my, my, my scope as my job. Um, if you don't have a conservator, hire one. There is no other way to accurately assess the light sensitivity of a material. At the same time, it's good to get our heads around particular vulnerabilities. And there may be institutions around there that, despite their best intentions, don't have access to a conservator. The Canadian Conservation Institute has your back. Google 10 Agents of Deterioration as far as dealing with the entire issue of the museum environment and what we need to deal with. CCI has done an extraordinary job providing good, easy to use materials, and they provided this chart. This chart includes information about assessing different light sensitive materials to just get our heads around the, uh, the problem. It doesn't replace a conservator, but it may be a good starting point. The intensity of light. Here he says, use the minimum amount of light needed to experience. That may be 50 lux, it may be less, but you use the smallest quantity of light for the highly light sensitive and moderately light sensitive materials. Only the most durable things, oil paints are still light sensitive, but we can use more optimal amounts of light. Now, when we were creating the recommended standard, all lighting applications, whether it was for a classroom, a casino, all lighting applications were encouraged at that time by our professional society to deal with the issue of age because older people need more light to see equally well. And if people over 65, for example, as we just saw, want to see equally well as younger people, you need to double the amount of light. You're going to double the amount of damage. But if you want people to see equally well and have equal access, that's what it takes. Like I said, today we are dealing with paradoxes, that tension between display and preservation. And if you hear me agonize over it, it's because these are agonizing choices. The duration of exposure. That's the distinction between highly and moderately light sensitive materials. For the record, it's actually difficult to assess a material between highly light sensitive and moderately light sensitive. Um, Microfidometers, where we used to, where we would take a almost, mic almost invisible point on an artwork and damage it just to a just noticeable fade. This scientific instrument used to be the purview, purview exclusively of conservation scientists. It's making its way more and more into conservation labs because for its sole application of distinguishing whether thing is, whether things are highly light sensitive or they might be just a little bit more durable, you still light them with 50 lux. 
the quantity of light doesn't change. What changes is how long they may be able to stay on view. Again, all of those light sensitivities are determined by a conservator. But the duration of exposure, when to put things on view and when to take them off and when to loan them, that's a museum decision. One thing, another thing to note here, and this is a page out of RP30, a recommended practice for lighting. This is um, one of the few books that deal with lighting and all its complexities. We included from CIE 157 this chart, and I'm sorry to include so many complicated charts, but this is an important issue. What it says is that first noticeable fade, these are objects that are in great condition or brand new, happens very rapidly. On the x-axis is the total amount of energy, and on the y-axis is that noticeable change. And a little bit of energy at the beginning of an object's life or things that haven't been exposed to light happens very fast. But every time that object gets damaged, the next set of damage happens slower and slower at a logarithmic rate that's specific to the action spectra of a particular dye or pigment. It's complicated deal to deal with, but it's important to know that we our most precious things are the, are the things that are most colorful and that have not been damaged. And that as things get damaged, Things that may have started at light sensitive, light, light, very light sensitive, may not be as light sensitive after we've damaged them. And finally, the use of daylight. In short, daylight is not recommended for highly light sensitive materials. It's not recommended for highly light sensitive materials. And I'll get to why. Low light sensitivity materials, I'm not gonna tell any curator that they can't see their artworks under daylight. It's also important to say that we shouldn't get too crazy here. In some, and, and we put this into the metric to really just put it in black and white, that small quantities of daylight of 10 lux are acceptable. It, light isn't like poison that if it enters the room, it's gonna, it's gonna spoil everything. And, and the smallest quantities of light may be acceptable in these, in these environments. So why can't we exhibit our um, works of paper under daylight? First of all, it's difficult or impossible to maintain 50 lux. One of the, when, within illuminating engineering, museums are peculiar in that 50 lux is both a maximum and minimum value because we're trying to really optimize the quantity of light. And to maintain daylight so it doesn't go above or below is extremely difficult or impossible. Turning off the sun is hard before and after hours. If people are in the gallery, if, if artworks are being lit and there's no one in the galleries, they're being damaged for no reason. And the spectral damage function, like I say, is higher for daylight. These two issues, intensity, duration of exposure, are museum issues, and we have to deal with them as a community. Edward, when we're preparing for this talk, asked a very good question. Who's responsible for damage? That is the result of overexposure. And of course, it's all of us. Probably best led by the curator, because they are best, admit, best able to manage what do they really need to see in the object and why they chose that object for view. What is the exhibition plan for that object? And how long can it stay off view? The artist absolutely has a say, especially if they own it. If they don't own it, we're trying to serve the artist and we want to know how they wanted the artist's artworks experienced. Conservators, expert counsel, not lighting police, but counsel so they can give us advice about how long things may last under a given amount of light and duration of exposure. Conservation scientists help us set standards and may have access to tools that the typical conservator does not have. The lighting designer, their job is my friend Stephen Weintraub says, is making every photon count to make light look as bright as possible. The exhibit designer has more to do with whether a space looks bright or dark by choosing light colors or dark colors. And doing everything we can to manage the experience so visitors' eyes are tuned um, for experiencing low light levels. 
registrars, collection managers, monitor lighting levels, record them so we get an idea of duration of exposure, manage loans. So we make sure that our loans are being managed in a way that's responsible. Just a small list of what each one of these people do. And the ultimate responsibility is on the owner, the museum director, and the, tri and the tribal owner as far as whether, as Stefan Mikowski says, these objects have a short effective life or a long shadowy one. I didn't include stakeholders. Within that list of people that are responsible, but the stakeholders involved are visitors and scholars. And I think these are two groups with two different needs. And Professor Strelick, from University of College London, it's where he's now, has been doing extraordinary work with a whole other team of people dealing with these issues about and, and interviewing people about what th people's needs are so we can deal with these preservation and difficult, vulnerable preservation issues with a little bit more clarity. And, the, and the, the, these two stakeholders, people's need to see today against people's need to see in the future. And with that, justifiable damage. I want to show you a couple examples of how we've dealt with this at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. One is Miguel Luciano. He's got two artworks by him here. Palente, which is slang in Spanish for forward in juxtaposition to his artwork showing these bikes that are going nowhere, expressing some of the dilemmas that Puerto Rico is facing. He wanted, Miguel wanted these artworks to appear very bright. He didn't want this wonderful, playful artwork that's expressing something very serious to be in the dark. Unfortunately, the flags that are integral to his artwork are very light sensitive. So what did he do knowing this was an issue? He made us lots and lots of flags, very special flags, because the blue is chosen very particularly for this artwork. Another example, one of my favorites, is this tapestry by Sheila Hicks where it's a very light sensitive artwork. It actually had been installed at the IBM um, headquarters and had been damaged. And the studio recovered this entire artwork with fresh silk. And this is the first exhibition of it. As soon as, as soon as I saw it, I'm like, this thing's about color. If you don't see the colors and the vibrancy, you're not expressing what the artist is communicating. At 50 Lux, it was dull. At 75 Lux, it was dull. It took about 100 to 120 lux until you got the vibrancy of these colors. I then had a difficult conversation and we got together with the curator and the conservator. Are we gonna damage these artworks more quickly or are we gonna pull them off of, art, off of you sooner? Those are hard choices, but to damage them at 50 lux without providing access to what the artist is communicating that is not justifiable damage. And if you know anything about Sheila Hicks' work, who is she a student of? Annie Albers and Joseph Albers, the great colorist of the 20th century. Sheila Hicks' works is integrally about color. And that takes us to our next topic. If I was anything of a less intrepid presenter, I would stop right there. But I do want to give you more information, especially specific techniques and some of the latest things that we're doing in museums with technology. So this is more of display categories. And I'm talking specifically about how we see light. It's not about pretty lighting fixtures like chandeliers or even the luminaires we see, but how these fixtures cast light, like you're seeing from this downlight on a wall. And from here, you're going to see a lot more images and, and fewer, fewer uh, um, graphs. So this is a Western quilt exhibit exhibited at the Renwick many years ago. What you're seeing is 50 lux light under work light. And this is a perfectly fine way to see an exhibit. We often see exhibits like this. But what we did with our team is we went in, worked hard, in a 40-hour spotlight very carefully each work of art. And this is what you get. This is making every photon count and make, providing a most dynamic, the most dynamic experience to our visitors possible. Here are our tools. We're now moving to LEDs, and I hope that all of your museums are moving to LEDs. There's no reason not to. LEDs can do everything incandescent can do, if not more. 
You can do it with retrofit, which is just taking different light bulbs and putting them in your old lighting fixtures. All LEDs are not equal. Some are higher and lower qualities of light, but good LEDs can match and exceed incandescent. It's not because LEDs are so good, it's because <laughs> incandescents weren't that great. They were super hot, energy efficient. They didn't last that long. Incan LEDs are just better. And at this point, they've proven their paces. If you use retrofit, don't expect your LEDs to last as long. They're gonna burn out sooner. You have to build a lighting fixture from the ground up with LEDs in order for them to last as long as possible. Whether um, it's a fixture that's seen here, and this is kind of an old example. Oh, there's lots of examples. The light bulbs can look like this for a retrofit. Or this, I wanted to, for this show, for this talk, I wanted to include a reflector lamp. This is the simplest lamp. They made them incandescent. They also make them in LED and provides a very soft edge of light. And creating a softening edge of the light is difficult for a lot of people, and especially people that aren't used to using lights. This type of fixture relies on lenses and is a very low glare fixture. This fixture may, more, may be more glary if you expose the viewer to this edge, but it's gonna give you much more easily with less skill a soft edge of light. Not as good necessarily, but easy to use. Um, for the purpose-built integral LEDs, they can look like anything. Really, the sky's the limit. They can look identical, and there's no way of knowing whether it's a retrofit or an integral LED. This is the um, system that we recently developed with American Art and the Portrait Gallery. And um, we use about half spotlights and half floodlights. Our spotlights are four degree spotlights, the narrowest beam we could possibly come up with. And then we've got a whole array of lenses to tailor that light as specifically as possible. The floodlighting is much more likely to be used for very light sensitive works and much easier to use. Let me show you how that's done. Oh, and it's important to mention that these lighting fixtures use Bluetooth. That in the old days, we used window screen, which is perfectly fine to reduce the quantity of light very simply and easily. Window screen is a great choice, very simple and dead easy, and I highly recommend it. Dimming LEDs can be difficult, especially if you dim the entire circuit. You want to deal with LEDs. LEDs are digital devices, computer devices, and dealing with them digitally is the best way. Bluetooth actually deals with that voltage in the most um, sophisticated way, and there's a couple ways to do it. Bluetooth is excellent, and that's what we're doing at an American Art and Portrait Gallery. I wanted to show you this dot here. This is actually behind this dot are six LEDs providing a full spectrum experience. Mixing the LEDs in a chamber, very complicated to do. Then we have different lenses, and there's a whole range of lenses that can sit on top of um, this LED. Let me show you how it's installed. That's an aluminum optic, very bright, but kind of throws light everywhere. This is a lensed optic, not quite as bright, but it really focuses the light much more specifically. And we've got lots of options here. It's also no interesting to note that the same LEDs in a larger scale are brighter, smaller scale fixtures are dimmer and may not be able to um, flood the light as, as quite as well as larger lighting fixtures. And this is a framing projector that you're seeing over here. This is um, one of our old lighting fixtures. It would take a retrofit lamp. I just wanted to keep on a slightly deeper, di deeper dive. And it doesn't make a difference what you use. Good lighting fixtures will have glare control, which you're seeing in this Hexel louver. This form of lighting fixture was invented by Edison Price, I believe for the Whitney in the 1960s, using lenses to soften the light. I wanted to give a quick example of how we're doing this in the galleries. Two layers of light, spotlights and floodlights. This, both layers are on now. I'm gonna turn off the spotlights. This is just floodlighting, perfectly acceptable for very light sensitive materials, but I'm using lenses to soften the light. If I take the lenses off, you see these scallops. The lenses blend the light smoothly. And I add my spotlighting in. This is now just spotlighting, which doesn't look good either. It looks spotty, but having these two layers of light for oil paintings is quite a good choice. 
difficult to do for very light sensitive artworks because there's not a lot of gamut. 50 lux is so close to the lower limits of vision that you can't see your labels at those light levels. Wall washes are open to the wall to create flat lights, flat um, beams of light on the artworks. This is um, my cat. And um, the light, one of our recently installed galleries with this new lighting system at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, where we created new series of wall washers that you're seeing here to evenly illuminate the lights from floor to, the walls from floor to ceiling. Um, very difficult to do. It takes a tremendous amount of hand skill and luminaire engineering. It's also interesting to note that even at 200 lux, the Gene Davis you're seeing here could use even more light to create what Gene Davis asked us to do, which is to create color so vibrant. He wanted people to experience color so vibrant that it almost hurt. That's what Gene Davis asked for. So even at 200 lux, we don't quite get that. And a trick of photography is that this looks equally bright as the much dimmer levels that you're seeing at the Mineral Drawing Institute for the Ronnie Horn exhibit. This was a design by George Sexton, where he, again, he's using wall washers to provide an even wash of light. In juxtaposition to another example from the Manil, where they're using darker wall colors, so the artworks pop on this like 18th and 19th century artworks. And that's one of the most powerful things we can do is use darker wall colors to make things look brighter. And instead of using wall washers, now we're using object lights with a flat front to get the energy right on the line. Another example at American Art, where for this daguerreotype exhibit, I'm using spotlights to go even a step further, spotlighting each and every artwork to make every photon count and make the artworks as bright as possible. It's important to note that these windows are so highly filtered, they provide almost no light. And I'll show that to you in a moment. And I did want to give a shout out to my installation team. It takes a tremendous amount of work to do a good job in lighting. I can't underestimate enough, underestimate enough how grateful I am for the team that works with me to get that job done. The angle of light. <clears throat> And from here, actually, I need to skip some in order to stay on time. Um, I want to show this example because it's the most common types of glare. Glare is not really a huge issue from the spotlights, but much bigger issue from bright windows behind you or for especially large artworks from the spotlights. But the, the paintings have to be quite tall before the lights above create an issue. This is a portrait gallery artwork. This was exhibited when there was a window behind it. The portrait gallery did the best thing you can do to improve the quality of light. They hired a lighting designer. Alex Cooper took this, he relit it, and I'll show you that in a minute. And they also removed, they, they hung it so there's not a window behind it. And if you take a look at the rainbow in the upper right hand corner, you see the rainbow come out as Alex lit, lights it to best effect. The most common lighting level recommended is 30 degrees, and that really works well for flat artworks like works on paper because people's head won't create a shadow in the artwork, and the light that bounces off of the artwork is unlikely to hit people's eyes, whether they're seated or standing. It's called veiling reflections. The movement of light. First of all, please turn the lights off. If the lights are on and people aren't enjoying the artworks, it's not justifiable damage. Turn the lights off. In our days, there are lots of ways to do it. Occupancy sensors are already likely in your galleries for security. At the Renwick Gallery, we tied the security lighting sensors into in with the gallery. So before the galleries are opened, we can turn the lights on and off depending on occupancy using equipment that's already there and already being maintained. Now with Bluetooth lighting, that's communicating between sensors and the lighting fixtures, the, a whole new world of possibilities are open. These are pretty small sensors. The one you see here costs under $200, I think it's $120, and can measure passive infrared, that's occupancy. 
It can measure lux, temperature, humidity, and an accelerometer. And while you may put these on the ceiling, that's not where you want to measure your temperature and humidity, or whether someone's stealing your artwork, these sensors here, you see these little dots? They can take remote sensors, so you can remote your PR sensor or your lux sensor to where you need them. It's, it's extraordinary. And you can, I guess, put these sensors anywhere because they're communicating via Bluetooth. Um, recently, my team at American Art developed some new technology where, where we used we weren't satisfied with the existing passive infrared sensors to um, protect artworks from damage. So we took one of our lighting fixtures and we put a camera inside of it along with a Raspberry Pi. And we coded it so it would be integrated with our Wi-Fi system and then be able to communicate with both security and potentially our Bluetooth lighting fixtures. So we could more specifically define the area of motion. This is what we did home baked at American Art. There are lots of things we can do here and it's a very exciting time. All in the service of movement. Solar path. You can see a little bit of light coming from the floor here. We have so heavily filtered our windows that it's not a problem. But the most damage that's likely to happen to your artworks is by windows and unfiltered light hitting artworks. Let me show you how we did it at American Art. First of all, we picked glass very specifically. Dark glass. But inevitably, it's very difficult to get that right. And the best architects won't. And maybe they even shouldn't because more reversible techniques that we can use after the fact may allow more flexibility, like window film applied directly to the glass. A second layer of window film, when you take two layers of film, the result is exponential, not additive. So two layers of film is incredibly effective. And that's what you're seeing here. And then a layer of scrim. This whole sandwich of light reduces, in our case, 99.9% .9 of the light. So it, what you're seeing through the film, through all of that layer, is the Norman Foster skylights. You still provide an exterior view and a sense of a window and makes architectural sense of the galleries. Yet we're getting about three, 30 lux on the floor, a really minimal amount of light, and being careful to s situate our walls so that light doesn't hit the artworks. It's important to note that that scrim, the main utility of that scrim, is to soften the background so the outside view isn't competing with what's going on in the galleries. Um, I'm going to skip through this because Edward did a really wonderful job describing what they have done at the Manil to create the conditions where, as Kelly says, allow people to commune with drawings with levels appropriate for that function. I was also thinking... Um, the Freer, where I started my career with Richard Skinner, and a lot of our older buildings of, are great examples of vernacular architecture, where our buildings were not as bright once you walked into them, and the lobbies didn't have great amounts of daylight and glass, but they conditioned our visitors' eyes in a dimmer era to lower light levels with grand lobbies that weren't necessarily as bright. The Mill Nil did it, as you said it, with the, with, um, the architect. And uh, George Sexton took the time to explain to me that the Manil planned plantings that, as they reach foliage, will step down the level of light before you even enter the gallery. And you, the, another step down of luminance when you hit the steel canopy. It's important to note that the architect and, and designers chose dark finishes. And George, I thought this was just brilliant, that it's not just the quantity of light, but of course the luminance, how much light is heading back towards your eye, so conditioning viewers' eyes with dark finishes. So once you enter the museum, your eye is more conditioned. And lastly is spectrum. And I think we may have run out of time here. And Kelly, can you give me some guidance about whether we should... Um, start talking about Spectrum, or should we call it here and take questions? Okay, thank you, Kelly. And thank everyone for their time today. Um, the spectrum of light 
and all of these qualities is to own them, master them, and use them so we can provide the most dynamic experience of the objects possible. The spectrum of light is really split into two applications that require two different choices. One is color matching when you want to make sure you want to tune the spectrum so this matches that. This is where daylight actually does an extraordinary job. And in conservation labs, when they were doing in painting and treatment work, you want that. But you you need actually multiple different spectra <clears throat> in both warm and cold temperatures in order to achieve that color matching application. One, what does one light won't do it? You have to try multiple ones. And good conservators will always do that using, hope, preferably, daylight as well as gallery lighting. There's another application that requires a different spectral choice, and this is color appearance. And I really learned this, and I'm so grateful to Naomi Miller, Michael Royer, and the entire team at the Pacific North, Northwest National Labs, as well as the folks at NIST. Wendy Davis used to be there. She's now at the University of Sydney. Yoshi Ono, oh my God. These extraordinary scientist allowed me to get my head around this. That color appearance is a really different application that requires a different tools. And this is what you see in the art gallery is that you're not comparing this to that and you can use your eyes. If it looks good, it really is good. We assessed light before. I'm going to show you how we do it with the LEDs. Almost all LEDs start with blue. Um, and we take blue and we mix it with a phosphor, and that's how we're creating white. And as those phosphors get closer to the blue source, they explode in whiteness, and the blue becomes white light. Now, what is the color of white light? That depends on the quality of phosphor and the quality of the LED. And whether, so what the color of light is called chromaticity, and the color and that spectrum of light its ability to allow us to see a broad range of colors that's color rendering we assess the color of light on a chromaticity chart the first ones came out of that early work in the 1920s where it shows that we predominantly see green light and they then describe light on this locus with kelvin temperature from yellow to blue but it's important to note that yellow the green and pink are also important. So if your LEDs don't ma ma match two LEDs of the same Kelvin temperature, it may be because of this pink to green shift that Kelvin, Kelvin only measures yellow to blue. So that's chromaticity. It's important to note that chromaticity we will largely adapt to in about 30 seconds. And that some colors are what they call color inconstant, but most colors are color constant, which means we white balance and you don't have to sweat the details of small amounts of light. I know a lot of people go nuts distinguishing between 27 or 3000K or 3500K. What is the right color for seeing artwork? It's really a matter of taste. And if you only pick one color, you're going to white balance to it. And also what we know because Joseph Albers is in our pocket and he taught us that it's not absolute color, but how colors interact. And he sees it and he says it as only Joseph Albers, Albers can bluntly that he who claims to see colors independent of their illusionary changes fools only himself. And that color of light is what we're going to see. And Albers, if, if you own an iPad, please download the interaction of color. It provides access to the interactions of color that great book like you've never seen it before and you can redo the experiments like these two colors are the same it may look darker below than above but of course they're the same color here's a live example of that um and paul gregory shared this with me the great lighting designer from focus lighting where he's gonna we're gonna leave the spotlighting the same color and the background's gonna shift when you choose a wall color for your artworks you're doing the same thing. So when the background color shifts bluer, the, color, the, the light is not going to change, but it becomes more yellow. Did you see that? I'm going to go backwards. So the color of the artwork changes as we change the background, and it goes more yellow there.
It's extraordinary. This is exactly what Albers was talking about. That is the interaction of color. It's not color as absolute. This is all measured on the chromaticity scale. Color rendering very quickly. These are two color checker cards, which we use to assess color. They're complicated colors. They're, colors. they're not coming out of a printer, but they're pigment-based cards. And you can see that this colors are brighter, especially the green and the red. It's because of the spectral choices. On the right-hand side, it's a more discontinuous spectra. And by choosing that, we've expanded the gamut. And these are reflected colors, not light that the greens and the reds are colorful with more colorful with this spectra than with a more continuous spectra, more similar to incandescent or daylight. The metrics go down if there's any difference from the reference to the test. Now, we know that people, almost all people all over the world, prefer things to be more colorful. And it's important to know that the metrics don't tell us that. And color rendering index, this only has 18, despite its ability to make things look more colorful. This is very important for works on paper. Because as we dim the quantity of light, things become less colorful. And by tuning the spectrum, we may be able to bring back some of our access to color. This is experimental. A lot of people are working on this, and this is something to really keep your eyes on. And for conservators, to not only keep an eye on saturation, but hue shift. And we've developed new metrics, new metrics called TM30. And this group of people, these color scientists, leaned heavily on museums because what they saw is within museums, if the quality is good enough for us, it's likely good for a lot of other applications. Try all kinds of light. Depend on your eyes. We, in my, this is uh, our exhibit designers. This is Samantha, who we lost. She went off to the AIC. And Sarah, looking at wall colors. And they're not depending just on the fluorescence above, but trying incandescent light or LED light to see how our visitors will experience these colors within our galleries. Harvard was generous enough to let us show their print study room, where they've got um, many different types of lighting sources, especially daylight and the gallery lighting, and they can control the intensities. If you want to see what the, these artworks, to know, see them under all kinds of conditions so you know what they look like. And when you put them in lower light levels, you know what might be lost. Of course, everything, all the qualities of light, I'm going to be wrapping up, will impact how we see color especially intensity of light. The distribution, spotlighting makes things look more colorful. The angle of light will greatly impact. Spectrum is only one of many attributes of light that will impact how we see color. Most intense, importantly, like I say, is intensity because the Hunt effect means that as we lower the illuminance, things become less colorful. And here's a mock-up on this colorful painting by Corinne Davy and it becomes more colorful as we see more lights, as, as we get greater quantities of light. Not only that of the Hunt effect, but there's the bezel Brookie effect. And I'm gonna, this is the last slide of a great painting by Martin Kotler, my good friend and colleague, who was allowed to paint National Stadium in Washington, D.C. while it was being built. And he painted this construction worker wadding up the tinfoil that his lunch had been wrapped in and throwing it at a coworker, calling it the first pitch. Martin is a plein air painter. He's painting under 100,000 lux at between six and 10,000 Kelvin. When Martin is assessing his paintings in his studio, he is using incandescent or LED lighting at about 3,000 to 2,700 K. That illuminance is only about 300 foot candles or 3,000 lux, dramatically less. And it's a, it's a yellow light. It's not the blue light of daylight. And yet Martin feels, and this is anecdotal, but he feels that he can see his artworks in all their glory at much lower illuminance levels with a very different spectral quality. Important to note that as we go lower and lower, that we're going to bump into this Brezel Bokri effect, which is not only do we get saturation changes, which is the Hunt effect, but the hue itself may change. 
And with that, that's what I've prepared for you today. Um, this is, again, that URL where you'll get um, some additional information on museum lighting if you are interested. And I'm very grateful for your time. And uh, I apologize for going over a little bit. Please, Kelly, take it away. Thank you, Scott, very much for that. I enjoyed it as much forever. I think your ideas are really exciting and um, your ways of kind of getting at all of these issues are uh, really comprehensive. So thank you for that. I, if you're ready, I'll go ahead and launch into some of the questions that we've been getting and everyone please feel free to continue to send them in and thanks for, for sticking with us. Um, what I'll start with, Scott, is that there were a, a few questions kind of around this idea of accessibility and accessibility for older visitors. And can you talk a little bit about these other issues of accessibility that you see and that you seek to correct for? Um, and then specifically, you know, we talked a lot about lighting the artworks because that's what this webinar was about. But we had a couple questions about things about making the space kind of welcoming. You know, for example, occupancy sensors, um, people may not want to walk into a dark gallery. So can you talk a little bit about accessibility, uh, making visitors welcome, and kind of how you think about that in your lighting designs? Sure. So I spoke quite bluntly <laughs> about how people can see and can see at the low luminance level, low luminance levels, and to give visitors' eyes every chance to accommodate to lower levels. This is especially more important for older visitors because as we age, not only do our lenses yellow and thicken, but adaptation takes more time. One of the best things you can do is actually put a text panel early in the exhibit, and that gives people time to possibly adapt to lower light levels. The other thing I do is solicit complaints. Within the accessibilities community, there's this idea of expert users. Within my museum, some of my docents are much older. I go to my docent core and I say, can you see? If you cannot see, please let me know. I wanna know if people can't or don't have access to what we have on view, because then we should rethink our decisions. So get these expert users of people that you know don't have full vision, bring them in. I've, done, I've brought people in with macular degeneration and a whole host of um, problems. And th these expert user communities are out there and you can, you can, adapt, and you can uh, welcome them in so we can see how a diverse population of people are experiencing our artworks. As far as occupancy sensors, I think, first of all, we need to condition our public mm -hmm. that we can have a dramatic moment that as you walk into a gallery, there'll be a reveal of the artwork. And I think that as a culture, we can make that cultural shift. It's hard. I know a lot of museum directors do not want to do this. They are concerned that seeing artwork is hard to begin with. And asking people to walk into dark galleries is another barrier that we don't wanna ask them to do. Perhaps we have a bright artwork that's an oil painting or something that's not light sensitive at all that's illuminated particularly brightly and dramatically to lead people into these galleries. And to, to really, like I say, reveal the galleries and, and have people enjoy watching the lights get brighter and brighter as they enter. Um, does that answer the questions? Kelly, or is, would you like more? Absolutely, and I'll, I'll uh, segue into another question that we got from you thinking about you know, an oil painting in a gallery, for example, that might lead into darker portions of the gallery that have works on paper. So we had a few questions about how you grapple with galleries that many are increasingly seeing galleries that are mixed media, so that have works on paper, paintings, and objects in them. Can you talk a little bit about your approach or your experiences with a gallery that has a multiplicity of objects in it. So I had showed a slide before that showed a huge team of people. It is important to note that a lot of museums don't have that team of people and that in the smallest museums, the entire team may be one person and that per one person may have all of those responsibilities, in which case they'd have to ask their exhibit designer self, their curator self, how do we deal with this issue of mixed media? Ideally, we have experts in each one of these areas, knowing that if you have an oil painting next to a work on paper, what do we do? And often what we do is actually sacrifice the work on paper. 
So instead of not being able to see well both the oil painting and the work on paper and having problems with adaptation between the two, we liked the oil, the, the oil painting optimally. Um, and it's a real trick. Now let's say one of the, and it depends on the materials. If it's a light colored, light sensitive artwork, it may look great and even brighter than an oil painting that has a low reflectance. So a, a dark black painting at 200 lux will appear much darker than a white and lightly colored, very light sensitive artwork at 50 lux. So we can deal with these issues in their full sophistication and to lean on every expert you have. Have deep discussions with your exhibit designer, your curator, and grapple with how will the visitor experience the artworks on view, making little maquettes, doing scale models, doing whatever it takes from the process point of view to make it happen. And then when you bring in your lighting fixtures to then take another stab of it. I'm the last designer and the last member of that team to enter the galleries and the last chance to get it right and to do anything I can to manipulate the variables to provide good visual access. Wonderful, thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna ask, um, I'm gonna pepper you with a handful of um, kind of specific questions, but really around uh, different ways of displaying drawings and kind of your thoughts and approaches to that as well. So we had a few questions come up about how, you, how the use of um, you know, museum glass factors into that UV glass. Mm. Um, for works on paper and you're thinking about that, especially um, kind of different glares glass can have, the different color of glares that, that glass can have. Um, works on paper in drawers, um, that mm -hmm. display and thinking about how those are lit and what accommodations are made for that. And um, we had a, a specific question about um, black and white works and specifically kind of carbon-based inks and can that, is that something you factor in too? Is, is that something that can be um, at a higher, at a higher lux, perhaps. So a whole different, lots of different questions, but sort of circling around, you know, specific uh, works on paper installation choices. And then the last question was kind of the most leads to the most vulnerability of of people's well, kind of emotions. It's very difficult to know exactly what whether how light sensitive something is. If it's a carbon based ink, one hundred percent rag paper. What I'm told is that's an extremely durable object, and it may not be very light sensitive. That needs to be determined by a conservator. But determining whether it's carbon-based or a more fugitive dye can be very complicated. And we require conservators and conservation scientists to make that distinction. Um, does that answer that question as far as carbon-based dyes? And um, Jan, and if you're welcome to chime in if you have any more information to uh, provide about that. Um, like I said, I am a designer, not a conservator, and uh, I do not want to overstep my bounds in any way. Hey, no, I, I think that you're just you're spot on, and um, the idea that we're a team working towards this, and that conservators play an important role. Um, you know, one of the things that came up in the comments from Rachel Mustalish was, can we change our language a little bit when we talk about daylight? Should we be talking about um, not allowing unmodified daylight rather than not allowing daylight at all? And um, I think that's um, addressing some of the nuances that you're, you're introducing ways of blocking out all of the uh, UV and um, giving a vision to the world outside. And if we are able to accomplish that while keeping 50 lux and keeping the UV out, then is it a language issue that needs to be addressed in the way we're thinking about things and approaching this issue? Uh, I, I'd, I, I mean, my point of view is no. And within our committee, we argued furiously about this. And it was the decision of the committee and it was not unanimous. Um, I'm lucky that the committee I lead is um, consensus, not unanimous. Um, with the CIE actually requires unanimity, it takes them years to make decisions. Where the daylighting experts, and there are daylighting experts that feel that you can mitigate daylight to make them safe for very light sensitive artworks. That is not my feeling. 
If they use mechanical systems, we've seen these mechanical, sy mechanical systems break. There are spaces in museums that people swear, I swear, we're only going to put oil paintings in them. We'll never put very light sensitive artworks on them. And yes, inevitably, very light sensitive artworks go in those collections and they get damaged faster. And there, we're not necessarily, it's, it's not necessarily justifiable damage. But if that's the only space that is available for lighting these artworks and we can't reduce them down to the bare minimum amounts of light, I guess it's it's debatable whether that's justifiable or not. So I don't think this is a language issue. I think it's a hard choice to say no. Very light sensitive artworks, we need to control the conditions with such great precision that is just too difficult to do with something as mercurial and wonderful as daylight. And also, I'll be honest, when I see people try to do this and reduce daylight down to the bare minimum, the light you get out of it is so gray and weird that you really don't get the quality of light. One of the, um, for time today, um, I cut a lot of slides out. And one of my favorites was um, I took it the Freer Gallery and I got the same slide. Um, Stephen Weintraub had done this at the National Gallery when he took two images, one of the National Gallery, or in my case, the Freer, with the lights on, the, the electric light on, and one with the electric lights off. And it shows, and this happens at the Kimball as well, that the daylight contribution is reasonably small. And that what we get from daylight isn't necessarily light that allows us to see. There are other qualities of daylight that are extraordinary and that we may be able to preserve even within very light sensitive rooms, that we, prov we provide a sense of day that we provide sparkle and knowing that there's life and light out there. Um, a view outside can still be preserved while blocking 99.9% .9 of the light. So the artworks are being illuminated by daylight, but we still retain some of the characteristics of what we love about daylight. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the questions that came up was, is there anything we can do with the glazing to cover the artworks to right. help to mitigate that and I would like to say that I've actually done testing uh, you know um, in the lab with different UV filtering plexiglasses and demonstrating how even with a good UV filter on the glazing that you still it's not um, cure-all and there's still fading that occurs through those types of glazings and um, so that shouldn't be considered an answer to that question. So Re eliminating UV in no way stops fading. Mm -hmm. The largest factor in fading of organic pigments, which is a lot of works on paper, is the absorption spectrum. Basically, um, hey, I've got a blue shirt. The light that is being absorbed, the, the light that's hitting my blue shirt that allows us to see blue, everything that is being reflected, that's not what's damaging it. What's damaging is all the other spectral parts of the spectrum that are being absorbed by the blue short. So it is the, it's the light that's being absorbed by our materials, the light, not the ultraviolet, not the infrared, but the light that's going to be damaging organic pigments. UV filters are essential because UV isn't going to help and it's so damaging, but it's not going to stop fading. Um, UV is most, my understanding is UV is most likely responsible for yellowing, embrittling, but fading is a function of light, the same light that we see by. Does that make sense? Is that, does that jive with your understanding, Jen? Yeah, I think that um, there's a, a range of concerns there, and I'm sorry I was reading while you were talking too. Um, yeah, I think that... Um, you put it pretty well with the um, concerns and paper itself is not so simple that even what may look like a simple paper may have different, different fillers and coatings and things that have. And so, you know, it come, it always circles back around to come to mm -hmm. the conservator and the people who know the history of the object and the, you know, paper can be very complex and um, a couple of papers can look fairly similar, but react very differently in this, um, same circumstances. 
I've been very fortunate to, to have the company of, of many great conservators, Kate Maynard at American Art. Um, I started my career with Terry Weiser at the Walters, who trained me very well, and uh, a whole team of um, con- conservators, conservation scientists that, that got me on the right track there. Um, I didn't. I guess I didn't speak to glazing so much. Um, when I showed that Lansdowne portrait at the portrait gallery of, of George Washington, when you get to put a piece of glazing on it, it's going to act more like a mirror. So you're going to see the lighting fixtures themselves. And that's going to be the impact of the glazing. It's typically, unless it's a very large work of art, like you saw in the Ronnie Horn, it's going to not be such an issue with the lighting fixtures themselves. The glazing is most likely going to reflect something brightly colored behind the viewer, the white wall, the window, a computer monitor. And the best thing you can do is exhibit design, is to provide the conditions so you don't see those things. This is going to be especially a a, a large problem for darkly colored objects, um, blacks with glazing in front of them, is we're going to get the largest amount of reflection. Um, Sorry, at the Manil Collection, we've gone to largely using anti-reflective glazing practically all of the time. And I think that even if the light is dim, if you have 50 lux and something that has a reflective glazing and a non-reflective glazing, your viewing pleasure of the non-reflective glazing is is so much um, higher. So that's been, there are a lot of factors other than lighting that contribute to an enhanced experience in low light level setting. And it's, it's also interesting to note that those um, coatings, when they're UV coated, that you're done. And um, you don't, I mean, we want, we want to filter all UV as much as possible in case something is not glazed. Almost all works of paper are. And um, daylight at this point is the most um, likely to have uh, UV is the, is the lighting source as we move more and more towards LED lighting, which is likely to have no UV. On that front, we've had a number of questions about um, kind of comparatives between LEDs and, and incandescent, about is there levels of uh, difference in damage between the two and kind of experience of, of the work between the two. Can you address sure. um, design, designing differences in using each of those and if there's differences in damage between using each of these types of so to, to actually assess the rate of damage is extremely complicated, and you have to actually look at and know what molecules are present in each color. But we can have some general guidelines for something called spectral damage function. Joe Padfield at the University, at um, National Gallery London, has, he's got a website that deals this with this beautifully. And that'll allow us to assess whether this light bulb is more or less damaging than that light bulb, and that's spectral damage function. In short, most LEDs that are starting with a blue LED are less damaging than most incandescent and halogen lamps. Some of the most popular LEDs used in museums are starting not with a blue LED, but with a violet LED. Those LEDs are roughly equivalent to the incandescent halogen lamps. Um, so it, it depends. And what spectral damage function allows us to do is measure wavelength per wavelength and integrate it with some decided upon standards to allow us to see if this light bulb is more or less damaging than that light bulb. Daylight, because it's so it's always going to be bluer, is going to be more damaging than either the typical LED or incandescent. Um, there's a little bit more to say about that. When we were writing standards for LEDs, there was the thought that the warmer LEDs for light-sensitive artworks may be more suitable. And this is a little bit controversial because the most light-sensitive artworks are actually more sensitive equally across the bands. But because very light-sensitive artworks are so susceptible to damage, we want to do everything we can. So the general recommended practice is to choose warmer qualities of light, like 3000K or so. Does that, was that clear? Does that answer? I think so. Can you answer a couple of questions about your specific fixtures and um, maybe the 
the Bluetooth functionality? Can they be controlled individually? Um, you know, what kind of software do you use? Is it easily um, readily available? So I've, I've been presenting for a while now, and I've really tried to democratize uh, what you can do, which is that if your goal is to see well, you can do that with whatever you have available. And the idea is that whatever lighting fixtures you have in your museum, you use them to best impact. It could take me an hour to light a painting. And I urge you to try to spend an hour lighting a painting. You, you're, you're the people in your museum may have never spent that amount of time. And if you don't have good control over your lighting now, no matter what technology you use, technology is not gonna solve your problem. This is a design issue and getting skilled people on the ladder using light for all it's worth. That said, I am now, I feel like leaping out of what used to be doing that to a much more rarefied world of Bluetooth lighting, where yes, we can tune each lighting fixture, not only the intensity of light um, without using window screen, which I used for 20 years and love, but now we're going to sit down at a computer and from the floor tune the quantity of light. And for those floodlights, we can tune the color. And this explodes the world of possibility that we never, um, in, in ways that we never even dreamed possible by setting up these Bluetooth systems. They are complicated, they're intense, it takes teams of people, it's still being developed. There are competing technologies like DMX, um, which do a great job as well. And there's pros and cons to each way. But the idea is that, yes, inevitably, we'll have control over each lighting fixture. Um, and to, to staff our museums with people that can actually deal with those complexities. Um, but whatever you use, use it for whatever, for as well as you can. And I, one of my great joys is actually going into smaller galleries and helping um, artist friends light their own work and, and using what's available and, uh, and making that work. So I think we have time for about two more questions. So I'll do, I'll do one and then we'll see what you'd like to wrap up, Jan, if you, how you'd like to wrap up, Jan, if you're comfortable with that. But um, there was a question in here that I, I found to be interesting and kind of responsive to the slides you had about your Gilded Age gallery and thinking about the original environment that that uh, statue was in, in a cemetery. And we had a question that was about how do you design a lighting scenario that's responsive to the environment in which an artwork was made? Mm -hmm. So specifically asking about an artist's studio, but you know, I would enlarge that question to the environment that the object was made in, you know, artist intention, tribal intention. Um, how do you think about kind of creating an environment like that in light? And maybe how do you specifically kind of quantify or measure what that original environment was like as part of your decision making? Um, I'm gonna reduce the scope of that enormous question tremendously. And because most, so much of your question is really the collaboration between the exhibit designer and the curator about what does that environment look like? I can talk about specifically about the light, which is, I give that example from, and that's, that's why I ended with that painting by Martin Kotler, where it, you don't have to re, you don't have to um, recreate the exact spectral and intensity value of what the artist created the light the um, artwork under. So the artwork in, in Martin's case, he he was painting outside exclusively as a plein air painter under very blue light with a lot of light. I don't have to recreate that to provide the visitor and the curator and scholar with the full experience of the artworks. Our eyes are very adaptable and flexible. And we can see with much lower lighting levels, down to 50 lux, absolutely, and get what the artist is offering with a very different spectrum and a very different quantity of light. We do not have to duplicate the lighting situation of how the artist painted under. Now, everything else about that and the rest of the environment that we create to, if it's important to have the visitor access those situations, that's, um, did I just say it's someone else's job? I just said that. 
And uh, that's kind of, uh, it, it's, it, this is beyond my responsibility as a lighting designer. So I hope that was satisfying. Um, one of the things that we look at is um, the idea of cumulative lux hours on artwork and the fact that, um, that that's really what we're looking at is a cumulative, cumulative lux. And it makes that a little bit complicated to, um, to figure out if you're using the entrance sensors that you're talking about, which I, I think that that's a, a nice idea, but I wonder if they have a way then of tracking the number of hours that they are um, on during an exhibition period so that if you have a place in your museum where you're tracking cumulative lux hours on a particular artwork that your sophisticated software would be able to give you an answer to say, you know, uh, maybe there was a 40 hour week, but it was only um, lit for 20. Um, thank you, Jen, that's, that's a great question. And there's a few things about that. One is in 1994, when the first recommended practice for museums was published by the IES, they included some Lux Hour recommendations. We removed them because we found that especially daylight designers were exploiting those recommendations and using them as a justification for using daylight when it wasn't appropriate. And that some of the galleries were so dark during the day, you couldn't see, so you could have brighter days on other days. It just, it was not working well. And the standard was obfuscating our mission. Um, and there's more about that. <clears throat> Which is, I'm sorry, this was, the, can you repeat the question I just, I. I if you're trying to track cumulative right. lux hours with the, with the motion sensor with the motion sensor yeah. system so it's important to know that if something is very light sensitive the lighting level isn't determined by the total exposure the lighting level it, it may be informed but that's really complicated because it's difficult to know exactly how many lux hours it'll take for something to to fade it is easier to look at our eyes and to be honest with ourselves as museum people and know can we experience this artwork with what is the minimal amount of light we need to experience the artworks in today's time that is more of a doable thing now what do we do with that occupancy sensor we use that occupancy sensor after we've established the lowest light level to save the artwork for future generations so will it be difficult to determine the total lux hours, yes. And yes, we use software to figure that out. But the savings of that artwork is what we give to future generations. And that's the compelling reason to use occupancy sensors. Does that answer the question? It was a little bit garbled there, but. That's good. I think there were a number of questions that were asked that we may try to answer later. Is that right, Kelly? Um, if there was anything we didn't hit on, there'll be later? web links. <laughs> no, not later, but no. Um, later, uh, like, I mean, well, later would be a different talk. It's a uh, mm -hmm. um, certainly. I mean, we you know we're looking at ways to make this entire presentation available, and everyone will be contacted when that happens. You know, we have a transcript of every question that's been that's been asked, and we will make that available to Scott. And there was lots of specificity in a lot of the questions, and we tried to kind of do the best we can to bring a lot of this in. But um, certainly, we'll also think through if there's a if there's a format to get some of these things more specifically addressed and get and get some answers to people. And, if I, and in closing, um, to join your professional organizations, that's where these discussions often happen. That's where the standards and the guidelines and the best practices are developed. Um, the American Institute of Conservators, um, the American Alliance for Museums. Um, PACIN is wonderful. I, I, I'm a huge fan of PACIN and on PACIN list. ARCs for the registra registrars. Um, for lighting people, the Illuminating Engineering Society. That's where a lot of these discussions are taking place. And it's, it's just extraordinary. And I'm very grateful to those organizations to allow us to have honest conversations and actually in a, a less vulnerable environment than 
our professional environment. Sometimes our, we, we've got so much at stake within our careers and our organizations that it's harder to have honest conversations and it's easier to have them in those professional organizations. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. You've, we're, at, we're right at 11.45 our time, so that's a nice round number. <laughs> and um, with that, I think we'll go ahead and, and wrap up. Again, thank you everyone for your eager, enthusiastic participation in the question and answer section. And again, we were just so thrilled to see, to see this response around these interesting and difficult questions. So thank you so and much. And thank you. And, and I hope people are using this time because this time is going to go on for a while um, to explore and expand. And it's going to be a while before we may be able to invite visitors in full force into our museums. And this is an extraordinary and unique opportunity to think and theorize in ways that we never dreamed possible. So when we, when we reopen, we will be able to do so stronger and more powerfully than we ever did before. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy Bye. the rest of your day. And again, we'll be in touch soon with follow-ups about recordings and um, you know, possibly some to think about how to get these answers to you all for your for your questions. So thank you all. Thank you, Scott, very much. Thank you.